Well, hello and welcome to worship today. We are so glad that you are with us on this mid-May Sunday. Well, today is a special day for some folks and families in our church. Today is Graduate Sunday for our church. We'll be recognizing our graduates in both services today. So we are glad to be able to share with you about them and then have a special time in prayer uh, in both services today for them. So our game today is actually in honor of our graduates. Many of them are going off to college, not all of them, but many of them are. And so for those who are, I thought our, it would be fun to do a game today about college courses, real or fake. So here's how this will work. I will flash up on the screen a college course in that college, and you just have to guess, is it real or is it fake? This is our second volume of this. We've done this from time to time, but it's always interesting to see some of the courses that are out there. And of course, not all of these are real, so you'll get the chance to decide. If you're joining us in the chat, feel free to put your guess in the chat, real or fake. All right, here is our first college course. Bagpiping from the Carnegie Mellon University. If you go to the Carnegie Mellon University, do you have the opportunity to sign up for bagpiping as a course? Well, that is a real course. If you were to go there, you could sign up for that as part of your music degree. All right, here is another one. Can, can you take a course in Elvish from the University of Wisconsin? Elvish, of course, from The Lord of the Rings, but can you take an actual course in that language? Well, for those of you who are fans of Tolkien and Lord of the Rings, you absolutely could. Or if you just needed a blow-off class, although I'm guessing that would probably not be a blow-off class. I'm not sure if that would count for a foreign language or not, but regardless, you can take a class in Elvish. All right, check this one out. How to meme at Hillsdale College. Can you take a class in learning how to meme if you were at Hillsdale College? Little Lord of the Rings meme there for you. Makes the internet quite often. Well, you could not take that class if you were at Hillsdale College. That would be an interesting class, though. All right, well, let's do one more before we give you a couple of announcements that you need to know. Here's another. The Science of Surfing from Cornwell College. If you were going to Cornwell, could you take the Science of Surfing? I would assume there would be some surfing. Maybe there would be a hands-on lab if that was a real course. But is that a real or fake course? Well, that is a real course that you could take. So hopefully, again, there would be a lab that would go with that, not just to learn about the science of it, but to actually get out and practice that. Well, we are glad that you are with us today. A couple of things to know. First of all, this is your first time with us or the first time in a while. If you would text the word fist bump to 94,000, let us know that you're there. We would love that. And if you would like to put in that text your physical address, we'd love to send you a little copy of this booklet called The Bible Story, one uh, story from Genesis to Revelation. Really short, brief read, but if you're not familiar with Scripture, it's a great way to get introduced to the overarching narrative of Scripture. And if you are familiar with Scripture, but you've just never really understood that whole process of Genesis to Revelation and that one sort of meta narrative that's there, this is a great way to kind of catch up on that and become familiar with it. So we'd love to send you that. Just put your address there in the box or the text program, and we would love to send that to you. And also want to remind you that if you are the parent of a, of a student or a child, third grade through 12th grade, that summer camp signups are going on, as well as Honduras sign up for our mission trip this summer with our students. So lots of opportunities for them this summer, along with VBS, check with Heather, our children's pastor, or check with Colby, our, our youth pastor, and they'll be happy to tell you more about those opportunities. But we are excited to be able to get back to those this year. Well, if you're just joining us, we are recognizing our graduates today as a part of our service for Graduate Sunday, and we're playing a game called uh, College Courses Real or Fake. So what you have to do is we'll just flash it up on the screen, a course and a college, and you just have to guess, is that a real course or is that a fake course? You know, sometimes the, the courses in college, you look at those and you go, really, that's a class? Well, that's this kind of game. All right, so here is our next one. How to watch television at Montclair State University. Is there a class to teach you how to watch television? I'm assuming if this is a real one, then it would be a little more in depth than just simply turn on the TV and scrolling through the options that are there on Netflix or on Dish. Well, if you were at Montclair College, you could find out what it is because that is a real course. You could find out how to watch television, probably not just to veg out, but to engage the brain a little bit. All right, here's another one for you. The History of the Hoodie at the Miami Fashion Institute. Does the Miami Fashion Institute 
allow you to take a class, give you the option to take a class on the history of the hoodie. Well, if you were in Miami, you would not be able to take that class. That is a fake class. So that would probably be interesting, some of the classes they have to offer there. All right, well, let's do a couple more. Wasting time on the internet at the University of Pennsylvania. Is that a real class or a fake class? Well, if you were at the University of Pennsylvania, you could 100% absolutely for sure sign up for a class called Wasting Time on the Internet. I would be very curious to see what that syllabus looked like and what the assignments were. All right, well, let's do one more for you. Here's our last one for today. Surviving the zombie apocalypse at Michigan State University. Surviving the zombie apocalypse. Could you take that as a real course if you were at Michigan State University? Well, you could indeed take that course if you were there. It's kind of a scary logo. Again, it would be really interesting, the um, textbooks that they would use for that. Well, I hope you had a little fun with that. Again, if you are joining us for the first time, we would love if you would text the word fist bump to 94,000. And at some point during the service today, as we continue in the Jonah series, if you would like to respond in some way today, you can text the word action to that same number, 94,000. We are excited to have you with us today. We are uh, excited to be able to recognize our graduates today and their families. Both uh, high school will be here with us, but we'll also announce our college graduates. For those of you who contacted us at the church and let us know about your college graduates. So we are excited because there is a lot that has been poured into these students over the years by many of you who are watching online and many of you who are on site. So we are grateful for that and we celebrate that with them today. And we look forward to what God has for them in this next season. We know that uh, life is an ongoing process, a journey. God continually works in our lives. And so we're excited to see what God does in the coming years with these students and grateful for their families. Well, thank you again for joining us today. Let me pray for us as we get ready to get started. And again, whether you are on site or online, we are glad to have you engaging with us today. Lord, we are grateful for the opportunity to come together and worship today. And we are grateful to come around the throne and worship you. And we are also grateful to celebrate these students and their families at these uh, kind of just really key transitional time. A lot of these students have been poured into by a lot of people in our church, Sunday school teachers, connect group leaders, VBS folks, camps, mission trips, all kinds of opportunities uh, to pour into them. And so we celebrate today the point that you have brought them to and look forward to what you will do. So may we worship you well today, and we are glad that we can celebrate them and continue to entrust them to you in the future and ask your guidance upon their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. How are we this morning? Good. Good to see you. I'm so glad that you're here. I want to say welcome to you. Uh, I am the student pastor here at First Baptist, and it's my privilege this morning right off the bat to uh, recognize our seniors. So uh, as I read these, would you observe the screens behind me and take a look at our seniors? First off, Abby Lee Hewitt, Abigail Webb, Brandon Dyberg, Brooks Bell, Cadence Barnett, Dylan Evans, Gavin Gordon, Jackson Sanders, Jacob Heffington, Caitlin Hartzell, Matthew Shirey, Matthew Williams, Meredith Magoo, Peyton Ballard, Samuel Spragans, Sandy Sentian, Savannah Godwin, Tanner Roberts, Will Ross, Wyatt Harrington, and Zoe Zoll. Would you guys give a round of applause for our seniors? All right, and let me bring up Bill Newton to talk about our college graduates. 
with us physically in the second service. We have a host of uh, college graduates, folks that have come through the church over the years, went off to college. We sent out, their family sent out, and they have graduated this year as well. So I wanted to take a moment and share that list with you as well. Uh, Kaylee Cassida graduated with a BS in biology from Washita Baptist University. Josh Koch graduated with an MBA from Henderson State University. Hannah Cook uh, graduated with a Doctor of Jurisprudence from the Mississippi College School of Law. David McCauley graduated with a BS in Mechanical Engineering from Louisiana State University. Cameron McRae with a Master's of Business Administration from Henderson State University in Arkadelphia. Paige Plumley graduated with her doctorate at UAMS College of Medicine in Little Rock. Seth Richardson uh, graduated with his doctorate in Theology from Northern University. Maddie Roddinghouse with a BA in Spanish and a BS in Biology from Washita Baptist University, and Grant Viscardis with a BS in Nursing from the University of Central Arkansas. So give a hand to our college graduates and their families as well. So lots of big moments for those in our church, many of our church family, again, many that you have poured into over the years. So we want to take a moment and ask Colby to come back up and ask him to pray over all of our graduates and their families and join us as he prays, if you would, pray for them. For our high school graduates, many of them off to college is their next step, as well as many of our um, college graduates. Some are going to the workforce and some are moving on to another postgraduate degree. So pray for them and their families, if you would. Absolutely. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much uh, for today that we get to recognize uh, these students, both high school and college, uh, and their families as they've been the support system behind all of this hard work and dedication. We would want to pray that uh, as they each begin to take new steps in life, uh, achieve different milestones, Lord, would you continue to, to guide them, to protect them? Would you help them to know that right inside of your will is where they need to be? That's the best place to be. Would you help them to often go to you when, when everything's going great, help them to go to you. When everything's going uh, down in the dumps, would you help them to go to you? Anywhere in between, Lord, help them to know that you're there, that you want them to rely on you, that you want them to come to you, communicate with you as often as they can remember. Lord, would you help them to overcome any, any concerns, any confusion or uncertainty that they may face as they take a big step into this next area of their lives, Lord? Would you Give them peace. Would you uh, comfort them? Would you encourage them and challenge them as they grow and, and go, Lord, in your name? Would you continue to be with their families as, as there's still room for them to support, as there is still places where they need their parents' advice, their grandparents' advice, Lord, whatever it may be, would you help the families to give the guidance that you lead them to give? Help them to grow together as a family. Help them to celebrate their accomplishments to give you glory for all that you've done. Lord, we're thankful for today. We're thankful that you give us these moments to celebrate our accomplishments and help us to recognize that that is all because of you. You give us everything. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You are with us today, whether you're joining us on site or online, thank you for taking the time to come together and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Whether uh, you are with us for the first time or you've been with us for a long, long time, we are glad that you are here. But if this is your first time with us or the first time in a long time, we would love if you would take your phone, just grab it real quick, no matter where you are, if you're in your living room or if you are here on site with us, and text the word fist bump to 94,000. When you text that, it'll ask you for a couple of pieces of information. If you would fill that out and one of our staff, we'd love to have the opportunity to be in touch with you, follow up in the next day or two, as well as if you would like to include your physical address, we would love to send you a copy of the Bible story booklet that we talked about in the pre-service video. And if you'd like to respond in some way today, whether you are uh, on-site or online, you can text that same number, 94,000, but text the word ACTION instead. It'll give you a variety of ways you can respond, prayer requests, church membership, uh, want to meet with a pastor, baptism, lots of opportunities on there. We would love to have the chance to follow up with you, see how we can pray for you, encourage you, walk alongside you as a church staff. Well, thank you for taking the opportunity to join us today again for worship. We'll continue on with our Jonah series. Our pastor, John, will tell you about that here in just a few minutes. But I invite you, first of all, to stand with us as we come around the throne to worship through music today. Thank you for being with us. Let's sing. Let's sing together a great hymn of our faith, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
morning and welcome as we gather to worship today. Kind of a senior celebration day and we're grateful to recognize our seniors. And got two of them singing on the platform today and we look forward to honoring them as well in the second service. So thank you for being with us as we worship. We've been in a series for a couple of weeks in the book of Jonah. I've been tracking with Jonah. We've followed him as he made the run from God to Tarshish. We spent some time with him in the fish last week, and today we're going to Nineveh. So uh, put your big boy pants on. We're going into enemy territory. So uh, thank you for being a part of this of this uh, study of this great prophet. I um, want to encourage you in this moment to uh, continue to be faithful in your giving. We are grateful that we can be a part of what God's up to in the world, and every time you give, your dollars are touching someone, somewhere. Uh, that's one of the things I look forward to in heaven, is seeing how some of the offerings that, that uh, we've made as a church, that I've made as an individual, how God used those, uh, and how that's reflected on the other side. So remember, you're not just paying bills. You're not just paying dues. You are giving into the kingdom of God, and He is blessing it. So let's be faithful in that. You can give at firsthotsprings.com slash give, or you can uh, give on site at one of the, uh, the nice little wooden um, boxes. I'll call them a box, beautiful boxes out there in the foyer and outside the doors of the balcony. All right? Well, let's ask God to bless uh, our giving and to bless what he wants to give to us as we worship him. We are grateful, Father, for your great love for us for the way you pour out your blessings on us. And we don't deserve these things. You just do it because you're good and because you're kind and gracious. And we receive them with thanksgiving. We thank you that upon receiving them, we get to be stewards of them, managers, so that we can, can become channels of your blessing to others and pray that you will continue to grow us to be generous people with all that you give to us. And God, we, we thank you that uh, as, we, as we give our offerings, you work through them in ways that bless lives. We get to see some of it, but most of it we won't see till the other side. But now we look forward to that. Most of all, we thank you that as we gather to worship today, you are here in our midst. And we pray you would have your way in our lives. That your word would go forth, your spirit would fall, and you would uh, save someone today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to sing together.
we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to open your book, your Bible this morning to Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. As we continue our series, our look at Jonah. Some want to live within the sound of church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue ship within a yard of hell. Evangelist C.T. Studd wrote that little verse. He didn't want to be comfortable. He didn't need to feel safe. He wasn't interested in working ground that someone else had already plowed. He wanted to run a rescue ship within a yard of hell, close enough to feel the heat and to hear the hurt. The man had a passion for lost people. It's a passion that he learned from God because God loves lost people. And that's why he sent Jesus on his cosmic rescue mission. Lost people matter to God. Maybe that's why when we'd prefer that God would put the boom on our enemies, God gives them time to repent instead. Maybe that's why God suffers fools and abides people that most of us Christians ignore, forget, don't like, can't stand. Do you think maybe God's crazy? He looks pretty crazy in Jonah. He calls his prophet Jonah to go to Nineveh and to preach against that wicked city. Jonah refuses. My pastor friend Blake McKinney imagined a Jonah action figure. You wind it up, point it in one direction, and it immediately turns around and goes in the other. God wound up Jonah. He said, go preach against Nineveh, but Jonah turns on his heel and heads the other way. No Nineveh for Jonah, and who can blame him? The Ninevites are pagans. They are scoundrels. They are cold-blooded killers. They are bad to the bone, make Attila the Hun look like Mother Teresa. The world would be better off without them. They march around the region, pillaging and plundering like pirates. They are a weapon of mass destruction. Their neighbors all say in one voice, they need killing. Jonah's not interested in any assignment that includes Nineveh. Let them go to hell for all he cares. Go, go, God says. Jonah says no. And Jonah's not the one who looks crazy here. So Jonah hightails it in the opposite direction. He catches a ship bound for Tarshish. God tracks him down, hurls a storm on the sea, and to calm the storm, pagan sailors reluctantly toss Jonah into the sea, and when the sea calms, they worship the one true God. See, Jonah has a way with pagans even when he's not trying. But instead of letting him drown, God appoints a great fish to swallow Jonah and to rescue him. Jonah makes his peace with God in the fish. He prays, he gives thanks. He says, I will fulfill my vow. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Could that be his way of saying it's not up to me who God loves and who God saves? Salvation doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the Lord. So on second call, Jonah determines to go to Nineveh after all. Now, he's not doing somersaults and cartwheels about this second chance, but he is obedient, and God can work with that. For reasons nobody can understand, God loves Ninevites, and he wants a word with them, and Jonah is going to be that word, and that's where we pick up the story today, Jonah taking God's word to within a yard of hell. Hear the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh, and preach the message that I tell you. Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's command. Now, Nineveh was an extremely great city, a three-day walk. Jonah set out on the first day of his walk in the city and proclaimed, In 40 days, Nineveh will be demolished. Then the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and dressed in sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne, took off his royal robe, put on sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he issued a decree in Nineveh by order of the king and his nobles. 
No person or animal, herd or flock is to taste anything at all. They must not eat or drink water. Furthermore, both people and animals must be covered with sackcloth and everyone must call out earnestly to God. Each must turn from his evil ways and from his wrongdoing. Who knows? God may turn and relent. He may turn from his burning anger so that we will not perish. God saw their actions, that they had turned from their evil ways. So God relented from the disaster he had threatened them with, and he did not do it. Nineveh, of all cities, Nineveh. Why would God give a rip about Nineveh? They were idolaters of the first order, the blood of their enemies on their hands, under their nails, stains on their clothes. By the time Jonah is on the scene, the Assyrians, and Nineveh's the capital of their country, are sitting on 100 years of atrocities. Not a decade, not a quarter of a century, 100 years. They were so proud of themselves that they wrote these down. They wrote down their atrocities, they etched them in stone. Braggarts, no nightmares, no PTSD for the Ninevites. They saw their atrocities as heroic and they loved keeping a record of them. Records brag of live dismemberment, often leaving one hand attached so they could shake the person's hand before he died. They made parades of heads, requiring friends to carry the, head, the heads of their friends on poles. They stretched out their enemies on tent stakes. They yanked out their tongues. They skinned them like catfish. Listen to King Asher Nurserpil II brag about his atrocities. I burnt their adolescent boys and girls. I captured many troops alive. I cut off some of their arms and hands. I cut off of others their noses, ears, and extremities. I gouged out the eyes of many troops. I made one pile of the living and one pile of heads. I hung their heads on trees around the city. No shame. And other kings with names like Shalmaneser and Tiglath-Pileser and Sennacherib were no better. Their actions akin to the Khmer Rouge killing fields in Cambodia, Hitler's Final solution, the genocide in Bosnia, the machete murders in Rwanda. There have been plenty, many of political and, and religious murders in the history of the human race, but none have been any worse than the atrocities at the hands of the Assyrians over a 250-year reign of terror. And then, some 50 or 60 years after Jonah preaches to them, they are going to destroy God's people, Jonah's people, the northern kingdom of Israel. So what in the world is God doing sending Jonah to preach to them. Why not send fire and brimstone instead? Does this make any sense to any of you? Why would, how could God care even one whit for a city like Nineveh and for a people like the Assyrians? I mean, if these folks weren't an earthly expression of hell, they were at least within a yard of it. But hell doesn't scare God, so he sends Jonah to preach to them in an incredible act of grace God gives his prodigal, rebellious, reluctant prophet a second crack at obedience. God would have, could have killed him in the sea, but sent a fish to save him. And what that pig farm did for the prodigal son in Jesus' story, the fish does for Jonah in Jonah's story. God gave Jonah time to come to his senses, and Jonah did. And God gave Jonah a do-over. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh, and preach the message that I tell you. God is telling Jonah, don't start, looking for a, don't start looking for a text in the Torah. Don't try to prepare what you're going to say. I'll give you the message when it's time and you preach that. Well, it wasn't much of a sermon. In 40 days, Nineveh will be demolished. That's it. That's the sermon. God went to all this trouble to chase down Jonah, half drown him in the sea, rescue him by a great fish and give him a second chance to preach to Nineveh. And that's the sermon. Five words in Hebrew, five, I think, in Assyria, probably the shortest sermon in the history of the world. I mean, where's the introduction? The three points, the transitions, the conclusions, the poem. It's a little sparse on illustrations, don't you think? In 40 days, Nineveh will be demolished. That's all you got? I mean, if that's all I'd have brought to my preaching class in seminary, the prof would have given me an F. And if I preached a one-sentence sermon here every Sunday, you'd be looking for another preacher. Or maybe not. Uh, but F or not, that's Jonah's sermon. That's the message that God told him to preach. Nineveh's a big city. 
took Jonah about three days to cross town and preach this sermon in one place and in another. Apparently, the sermon didn't change. He didn't polish it. He didn't lengthen it. He just preached it. In 40 days, Nineveh will be demolished. 40 days. Why not today? Nineveh has a 100-year history of atrocities and war crimes. Why give them 40 days? Unless it's to let them stew in their dread. If it's to turn them on the spit for 40 days before he burns them, all right. Jonah would be down with that. It's like telling the kid with an all-business dad, you're in big trouble, now go to your room and wait till your father gets home. Have a nice day. But the language indicates that God might have been doing something else here. There's two key words. The first is 40 days. 40 days is common in Scripture, 146 times in the Old Testament alone. It's often used to measure trial, to measure testing, transformation. Moses on the mountain, Jesus in the wilderness, Persons, even nations, can transform, can change in 40 days. And if they don't change in 40 days, they likely won't change at all. The second key word is demolished. When we see that word used in the Old Testament, it can mean either destroyed, as in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19.21, or it could mean turned around, as in God turning a curse into a blessing, Deuteronomy 23.5. The word doesn't guarantee repentance, but it does seem to offer the, 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 the possibility and the hope. The Ninevites could have, could have heard Jonah this way. If you do not repent, you'll be destroyed. But if you do repent, you could be turned around for good. Maybe they heard it like Jim Carrey's character in Dumb and Dumber. The way he heard the beautiful girl tell him that he had one chance in a million to win her affection. Carrie's response, so you're saying I have a chance. Nineveh's response to Jonah's sermon, so you're saying we have a chance. And boom, repentance breaks out everywhere. It took one day, not 40. Their repentance starts with common folks who heard Jonah's message, and then it gets all the way to the king. Everybody is repenting, confessing their sins, showing remorse by putting on sackcloth on themselves and their livestock. I mean, who does that? And the king even makes a decree ordering a national fast and a national repentance, calling on the people to turn from their evil ways and their violence. The story says the king got up from his throne. Well, of course he did. He realizes that that throne is God's throne, not his. So there's nothing half-hearted about the repentance. It is more than skin deep. It is heart deep. It is not lip service. It is life change. And they do it without, they do it without any guarantees that God would do anything other than demolish them. They know they deserve destruction, but who knows, says the king, God may turn and relent, and he may turn from his burning anger so that we will not perish. The king and his city throw themselves on the mercy of the Lord, and then they wait. They wait the results. And the Lord gives mercy instead of destruction. Look at verse 10. God saw their actions that they had turned from their evil way, so God relented from the disaster he had threatened them with, and he did not do it. Doesn't that sound just like God? Doesn't it? 100 years of atrocities. They repent, and God clicks the safety on the trigger of his wrath. God forgives them, and God was glad to do it. The word relent that speaks of God's change of mind is not a word of moral change. That's a different Hebrew word altogether. It's a word that carries the idea of breathing heavily or panting. Here's the word picture. When Nineveh repents, God <sighs> heaves a sigh of relief. God takes no joy in destroying the wicked. Never has, never will. He's not the kid who fist pumps when he destroys every villain in a video game. God had rather save than destroy. He'd rather proffer grace than destruction. God sends his prophet to within a yard of hell. The Ninevites repent and glad, God is glad to forego their destruction for now. But sadly, like all national repentance in the history of the world, it would be short-lived. Because in another 50 or 60 years, they destroy the northern kingdom of Israel. And then God will finally take out Nineveh in 612 B.C., God knows what we're going to do in the future, but God deals with us in the present. The Ninevites repent, and God gladly holds his wrath and is relieved to do so. 
He is a compassionate God. He is full of grace and mercy even to those within a yard of hell. It's quite a story. It's a gospel story. Is there any chapter in the Old Testament that's full of more grace than Jonah 3? Sinclair Lewis says it this way, the salvation of one Hebrew sinner is intended to produce the salvation of many Ninevite sinners. Grace and gospel for Jews and Gentiles, grace and gospel for all. There's a lot of good news in this chapter. Here's some. God loves and pursues the lost with a passion for their salvation. Ninevites were the worst. They were a city where Satan sat on the throne And yet God loved them enough to go to all the trouble of getting his reluctant prophet to go preach to them and to offer them that one chance in a million. We talk about loving sinners. God acts. He chases them down. He offers them gospel. He offers them Jesus. In reflecting on the story of Jesus calling out the the outcast tax collector Matthew to be one of his disciples, Brennan Manning writes, here's the revelation, bright as the evening star, Jesus comes for sinners for those as outcasts, as tax collectors, and for those caught up in squalid choices and failed dreams. He comes for corporate executives, street people, superstars, farmers, hookers, addicts, IRS agents, AIDS victims, and even used car salesmen. This passage should be read, reread, and memorized. Every Christian generation tried to dim the blinding brightness of its meaning because the gospel seemed too good to be true. But the gospel is true. Nineveh is a prime example. Though the cross would happen more than six centuries after Nineveh, Jesus died for the Ninevites. His blood covers their sins. And when Jesus rose from the dead on the third day, the Ninevites find life in that as much as you and I. And Jesus saves Ninevites and saves the worst sinners the same way he saves you, takes no more grace to save Ninevites as it does to save you and me. In the book of Ephesians, Paul prayed that the Ephesian church would be able to grasp how wide and how long and how deep and how high the love of Christ is. Now, we'll never be able to grasp that. It's too wonderful for us. And yet, somewhere in that height and width and depth and length, there's room enough, room enough for God to love the Ninevehs, the Chinas, the North Koreas, the Irans, the Palestines, the Israels, in the Americas of the world just to love them. And God doesn't just love them. He pursues them to save them and to bring them into his family. And that's good news in Jonah 3, and so is this. God loves and pursues his own people who go astray. God didn't give up on Jonah. God won't give up on you. You know, it's easy for us insiders us respectable sinners to feel a little smug about God's love but I don't know why I've seen some of your sin I've seen all of mine we can be self-righteous snobs looking down our noses at people who don't measure up to our standards or our tastes we gossip about our neighbors we assassinate the character of our enemies we can be filled with lust we act out in rage we can be consumed in our own addictions. We can shave the truth when it suits our purposes or is good for business. We can put our hope in politics instead of in God. We can be racist. We can be sexist. We can be greedy and selfish and snooty and full of arrogance and pride. Now, all that doesn't sound so bad compared to the war crimes and atrocities of Nineveh, but our sins have their own stench, not the least of which is our commitment to be our own God and to use God for our purposes, for our ends. You are not God. God will not be used. And yet God will not give up on you because of your stubborn sins. That's really good news for those of us like Jonah who assume we are better than others and better than we are. And there's more good news in this chapter. God invites us to join him in sharing the good news with the Ninevehs of the world. God invites us to get uncomfortable, to cross self-imposed boundaries, to value courage more than safety, 
to shelve our self-righteous prejudices to relate to people we'd rather shun and to share Jesus with sinners. Will you join God in his pursuit of sinners? I can do better at this. You can too. It's good news that God invites us to join him in sharing Jesus. And it's good news that God can use our witness no matter how pathetic it may be. We could say about Jonah's witness what Adam Bradley said about someone else. His words were amoebic in form, Jurassic in size. A five-word sermon that gives way to repentance and revival. God used his words through Jonah and God can use his words through you. You may think, well, I don't know what to say. God will give you the message just as he gave Jonah the message. You may confess, well, I'll be honest, I really don't love my lost neighbor, co-worker, classmate. Hey, Jonah didn't love the Ninevites, but God used his witness. And you may say, well, I don't feel comfortable talking to a lost person about Jesus. Do you think that Jonah felt comfortable walking right into the heart of enemy territory to speak an in-your-face message to people who enjoyed cutting off heads, yanking out tongues, and skinning people alive? God used his message. Here's the good news. It is not about you. It is not about you. It is about God. It is not about your words, your love, your comfort. Don't flatter yourself this way. It is about God. It is about his words and his love. And God can use your witness no matter how much or how little you say, no matter how much you botch it up. God can use it. And that's really good news. And so is this. Revival can break out in the strangest places. No one would have guessed Nineveh. Israel wouldn't have guessed it. Nineveh wouldn't have guessed it. But when God wants to do a work, God does the work. When God's word is preached and his spirit is in the witness, God is going to bring a harvest of faith and life in the strangest places. He always has and he always will. Our church has had a partnership with the Linka in Honduras for, I don't know, maybe 20 years. I forget the exact years. When we engaged in that partnership, we were told by some, you're wasting your time. It's a closed culture. They have this weird mix of Catholicism and tribal religion. They're the lowest of the low in Honduran culture. They don't trust anybody. They don't like strangers. You are chasing the wind. Well, through the work of dental missionaries, Billy and Betty Capps, the Linka began to at least crack the door a bit. And then we and some other churches began to make some trips and send some teams and build, build some rooms on school buildings and then send some medical and vision teams. And later, we added a modified Bible school for children uh, while we did those other things. And then we started showing the Jesus film. And then we started doing door-to-door -door around the mountains, food distribution and personal evangelism. And one of our teams just returned from building, I think, our sixth the sixth church building we've built among the Linka. And now the Linka are going on mission. They're taking food and gospel to other places in Honduras. And some said, that could never happen. And God said, you just watch me. If we are faithful to go where God sends us, to persons and to nations, revival can break out in the strangest places. If God can bring revival to Nineveh through a reluctant prophet, he can bring revival to the Lenka, to Muslim people groups, to North Korea, and to other places that are within a yard of hell. God can even bring revival to Hot Springs, downtown through our folks who are starting the Gracewell Church, and all over town through this church whose people are spread out across the county, are part of most every school, and work in all kinds of businesses. This is really good news. But who will hear God's call? Who will get up and go to the center, to the neighbor, to the lost nations? Will you? I mean, if God can save Nineveh through Jonah's half-hearted efforts... He can save sinners through your half-hearted witness. It's about God, not about you. So trust him and join him in loving pursuit of the lost to whomever and 
wherever he sends. Some want to live within the sound of church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue ship within a yard of hell. The ship is now boarding, and there is a seat just for you. Father, thank you that you reach down to lost people like us. We thank you that you make a way for us to hear gospel and to be saved and then to become witnesses to Christ who saved us. Stir our hearts today. Stir us to have a passion for lost people. Stir us not to depend on our own capabilities, but to trust you and to to act with the keen knowledge that, that you will speak through us. Thank you, Jesus. Now, bless us and help this church to to be more passionate about reaching the neighbor and the nations. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you this morning to respond to the gospel in Jonah to a God who's patient, faithful, gracious, willing to forgive, willing to to turn around the, the most wicked of people. And I invite you to Turn, give your life to him if you don't know him. If you're not saved, if you don't know Jesus, if you never trusted him today, turn from your sins. Say, well, he couldn't save, he saved Nineveh. He can save you. And I encourage you to throw yourself on his mercy and ask him to save you today. I encourage a Christian to get a face of a neighbor, co-worker, face of somebody that uh, you're Nineveh, that God would say, go, share the word. Get, get a picture, pray for that person, and then this week, act. Act this week. Don't wait, on, don't wait on the right time. Act. It will be the right time when you go trust God with that. I invite you to even come pray when we have a time of invitation for those people if you want, or for yourself. You can join the church, and you can do these things in one of two ways. You can text the word ACTION to 94000, or you'll get links that will help you navigate ways to share what God's leading you to do or you can come to the front when we sing this hymn of response there'll be ministers here to receive you let's stand together as we sing
today. Got a word of announcement before we go. Um, we're excited to bring back our senior adult gatherings. Haven't had those since the pandemic. Mike Pounders has agreed to serve as our senior adult pastor as well as his executive pastor work. But here's some details that some of you would want to know. This Thursday, May 20th at 1130 in the Family Life Center, uh, Keith Baker will cook a meal and this is for our senior adults and church members who are widows or widowers. They eat free. And everybody else is uh, five bucks a person. Reservations are required. You can call the church office or Mike's going to be out in the foyer and he'd be happy to, to sign you up with a reservation if you want to come this Thursday. We'd love to see you and love to have you. All right. That said, let's pray together and get ready to go to connect groups. I hope you'll be a part of a group. You can walk across the foyer and talk to someone at the welcome desk and they'll help you find a group that you could be a part of. We'd love to have you stay and get acquainted with some folks and study God's word in, in a little spirit of community. So let me encourage you uh, to do that. Well, let's pray and sing and, and uh, serve the Lord with all of our hearts. Go in the grace and mercy of God, whether it takes you within a yard of hell or next door and share the love of Christ with those who desperately need him. Amen. Let's sing together as we go. You are the refuge I run to. You are the fire that leads me through the night. I'll follow Again, we are so glad that you joined us for worship today. If you would like to respond in any way today, and there's lots of different ways that you can respond on the text program, just text the word ACTION to 94000. And again, if this is your first time with us, we would love to have you text the word FIST BUMP to 94000 as well. And we'll be if you want to give us your physical address, we'd be happy to send you a copy of the Bible Story booklet. We pray you have a great week, and uh, we look forward to seeing you here with us next Sunday. Don't forget, we also have Wednesday night activities for the whole family. Have a great week. God bless.